All right. Welcome back to the Semi Sages of the Pages and the super fun author interviews that we're doing for our Queens in Wonderland authors. Um, and I am here with Alicia Anderson, and she wrote One More Monster. And I love this story because it is about Alice, who is going on a quest for the Jub Jub Bird. And one of the things with the story that I loved uh, was that you find out about so many more of the characters in the Wonderland universe and in Lewis Carroll's wonderful writings than just some of the ones that you see in um, Alice in Wonderland retellings. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of those characters? So um, when I started writing this and researching it, I realized I started with the Jabberwocky and the, the poem, the Jabberwocky includes a lot of these like critters in it, right? The Bandersnatch and, and all of these things. And I started researching, like, where do they appear elsewhere in, in Carol's work? And I ran across this delightful poem that I think he published as kind of like a chapbook or a zine or something. Um, it was a little standalone poem that was called The Hunting of the Snark. And in The Hunting of the Snark, you get the snark, which is a huge thing. You also get the boojum, which is a, which is one a thing you don't want to deal with. And then you also get the jub jub bird in greater detail. And so um, you also get the entire like ship full of all the people who are hunting the snark. And it's, it's like a beaver and a, a butcher and a baker. Like it's a really strange combination of people. And so um, I, I really drew heavily from that poem because it was part of the world. And actually there are letters where Carol has, um, has confirmed that the snark is part of the the same world as the rest of Wonderland and Jabberwocky. So because of that, I felt like pretty comfortable kind of drawing all of those guys in um, without having to create anything new, just kind of like building on what, on what Carol already had done. Yeah. And it's, it's awesome. And that's part of what makes this story so unique is pulling in these these mentions that he has in other parts of his writing. Um, not we, we have a little bit of it in some of the other stories, but not very much. And I think that speaks really well to you as well, because you are a PhD candidate in, you're going to have to help me with it. So I'm actually a PhD as of like two weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> brand, brand new information. Um, I'm a PhD in mythological studies and depth psychology. So that is essentially comparative global mythology um, with like a little bit of an, an emphasis on, on archetypes and folk tales and fairy tales and that kind of thing. Um, I used my, my fairy tale retelling process to tell this story. And that's kind of where that like research process came from. That's awesome. That's cool. So what drew you to, to being a part of this anthology? Well, um, you know, when we were talking about it and I was thinking about it earlier today, I, I had this moment of, of like remembering this book, specifically this book. This is, this is Alice in Wonderland as well as Through the Looking Glass. And it is a red leather bound. It has the gold gilt edges. Um, and my grandmother gave it to me in 1986. And I mean, I even have my Garfield, my Garfield book plate Oh, <laughs> from, from when I was very small. Um, this was my fanciest book. It was my favorite book. And I was at that age of just voraciously reading everything that got handed to me anyway. And then to have like this really fancy book mixed in my love of Lewis Carroll kind of is a combination of my academic interests, which is like acts of the imagination and, and the archetypal, the, the fact that this is like one of my favorite actual physical things in my house. And then also that like my grandmother gave it to me and she passed away when I was only 17. So like tying it back to her is also a part of it as well. Um, so like Carol holds a very special place in my heart because of that. Um, and then I really liked this anthology call specifically because of the, the LGBTQ angle um, for it. 
uh, I came out as bi in 1994. And the thing is, is that I've been like in straight passing relationships pretty much um, for a lot of the last 20 years. And, and like, you were kind of always having to kind of reaffirm that identity, um, especially as, as bi, because the, the bi erasure. And so Mm -hmm. um, having the opportunity to kind of like flex those muscles a little bit, as well as play. And one of my favorite places to play was, was just completely irresistible. Awesome. Awesome. And your story is amazing. I know, I know our readers are going to fall in love with it. But was there any part in writing this story that was hard or challenging? Um, it hard or challenging, I wouldn't say I so when I write short stories, I I pants, you know, I plot Mm. longer form things, but short stories, I tend to pants. Um, which means that I wrote the opening scene and then I went off and found the snark. And then I went off and read the information about the Jeb Jeb bird. And initially when I first started writing this, Alice was going to kill the Jeb Jeb bird. Like, and, and that was my intention. And, um, the, the reading and the research actually kind of made it turn left because <laughs> it was like, oh, the, the, the story had a, a way, the story had one way it wanted to be told. And it very much kind of guided me toward, toward where the resolution was. So it it was one of those things where it surprised me, but in a great way, like, like, I really love how it ended up being. And I would agree with that too. The ending is surprising, but in such a amazingly fantastic way where you go, Oh, that was so awesome. I didn't see it coming. Um, and, and you, you actually like feel joy in the ending, or at least that's what I, that's how I felt with it. So I loved it so much. All right. The joy was a big part of it for me. I wanted, I think, especially with this, this topic and LGBT, LGBTQ kind of stuff right now, we need that joy. We all kind of desperately need that, that space of like safety and joy and optimism. So, yeah. And I will say, Uh, I was uh, doing another author interview and we were talking about um, how his story ends with um, a happy ending. And I realized how many of the stories in this anthology uh, end with a happy ending, even the sad stories. And there are some sad stories, but they still end on a good note. So I can't wait for everyone to to check it out. So where can they find you if they want to read more of your work? So um, my website is aliciakinganderson.com um, with no W's. Um, <laughs> and I have links to all of my various social media profiles there. Um, and there is a, a uh, tab in the top nav that is my work. And it has all of the short stories in the various anthologies. And as soon as Queens in Wonderland comes out, it will be on that list as well. Um, and that's that's kind of where most of my work lives. I do also um, make sure that like my Goodreads and Amazon author pages are up to date as well. So those are all linked in those places as well. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm going to go ahead. I'll put that website in the show notes down below. So um, our viewers can go ahead and, and check that out. And are we ready for a reading? Sure. All right. Great. This is one more monster. This is the very beginning of it. The uffish brutes were harassing Lily again. Alice pushed her pair of larger and smaller drinks away from the edge of the table and rose from her chair. Her thick dragon leather armor glittered in the firelight. The tavern was empty except for a few regulars. The Tweedles engaged in a rhyming competition that got more slant as they got more drunk. The white rabbit stared sadly into a draft of ale. Alice knew that even though she'd been visiting Wonderland since childhood, she still looked like she didn't belong there. When the locals had accepted a small girl with long blonde hair and a blue dress, they seemed wary of her now. The Alice. Her close-cropped shock of platinum hair and armor didn't help allay their fears of her. She'd seen too much. She knew the power of her imagination far too well. One of the Tweedles shuffled aside to let her approach the oaf whose fingers still lifted a lock of Lily's white hair. Fliberty bollocks, he intoned to his brother, attempting to rhyme respond to the phrase effervescent flocks. Do not touch her. 
Alice's voice was trembling on the verge of rage. She did not want to unsheath the vorpal sword at her hip. The massive hand dropped. The soft curl bounced a little, catching what little light it could as it returned to Lily's perfect shoulder. Alice looked into the bleary eyes of one brute and then the other. She willed her gaze to be piercing, nearly painful to withstand. Leave. The tavern was filled with shuffling, scurrying, blundering noise as the pair exited the tavern. Their tab, Lily whispered almost despondently. As soon as the brutes cleared the doorframe, the tavern grew quietly frabjous once more. Alice reached for the small leather pouch at her waist. I'll pay it. You shouldn't have to, Lily said, meeting her gaze. The dove gray eyes of the white queen's eldest daughter made Alice's heart leap into her throat. But I'll take it. This place brings in just about enough to keep me from the pawn line. But that's it. Alice was glad her leather-covered sleeves hid the goosebumps that raised on her arm when her hand touched Lily's in the exchange of coins. They were not lovers, but Alice dearly wished that they were. Love this story so much. I... I I kind of like kind of went backwards. Um, the the white the white queen's daughter Lily does appear in through the looking glass, and I was like, it's not too big an age gap once they're adults, right? <laughs> it's only like seven eight years. That's fine. <laughs> and that's so funny because that's um, that's your your history talking to where you're like, wait, what would their age gap be? Um, when really you're just, you're just pulling characters and you could, you could age them up. You can change their gender. You can, you could change all parts of them, but I, I have that problem as well. Um, because I've got, uh, in my story, I've got the white queen and the queen of hearts. And I, I was like, wait, does, is this possible? Does this work? And then I was like, wait, I, I can do whatever I want. Any, anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, that was awesome. Cannot wait for this anthology to come out. So depending on when, when you're watching this, it's either up for pre-order in all the places or it is available in all the places. So if you're interested in signed author copies, just go to www.nobadbookspress.com um, and you can go ahead and purchase those on the website. So Thank you, Alicia, for coming and joining us. Thank you so much, Teresa. I appreciate it. Of course. All right. We'll see you around. Take care. Bye.